I can hear the comments now. Only one chapter on the Holy Spirit? After spending so much time on Jesus? Yep, only one chapter. But it's not because the Holy Spirit is unimportant or an afterthought. Just the opposite. We've had four chapters on the Incarnation already. But even though the subject is changing, there are still some very practical questions that need to be answered. How do we put what we know of the Incarnation into practice? How do we live the life of Christ? How do we conform more to his image each and every day? Thankfully, we don't have to do any of these things on our own. There's someone to help us. Someone who Ambrose called the author of the Incarnation, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Chapter 12 is about the Holy Spirit. Now, every Christian who believes in the Trinity, by definition, believes in the Holy Spirit. But what do we believe about him? 56 years after the Council of Nicaea, there was a second ecumenical council to answer just that question. The Council of Constantinople took the Creed's original statement on the Holy Spirit and expanded it into the version we know today. That's why people sometimes call it the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. That's a mouthful. In chapter 12, we look at just one of those additions, the phrase, giver of life. Today, when many Christians think of the Holy Spirit, they think of power, miracles, and the supernatural good things, but that's not all it means to believe in the Holy Spirit as the giver of life. Not even close. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, a friend from my church promised to come over to my house to work on a project. The project was due a few days later, and this was the final opportunity we had to work on it. But when my friend arrived, he told me there was a change of plans. He was praying earlier that morning, and well, he told me that the Holy Spirit told him to make a fruit basket with one fruit for each of the nine fruits of the Spirit. And he was supposed to deliver this fruit of the Spirit fruit basket to a family who lived 45 minutes away. It's hard to argue with someone who thinks they've heard from God. So instead of working on our project, we spent the rest of the day trying to decide if long-suffering was more like bananas or kiwi and driving all over town. Then I spent the rest of the week scrambling to finish myself what we had agreed to do together. Now, my friend meant well. Maybe the basket was meaningful to the family. I don't know. But I do know this. One of the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. And, well, this story isn't a prime example of that. So much of what is said and taught about the Holy Spirit today focuses on the supernatural. We want to be led by the Spirit and hear His voice, even if it means dropping everything for a basket of fruit. But sometimes it's easy to forget how miraculous it is simply to keep our word or to forgive someone who wronged us, or to mind our own business, or to be patient in the middle of rush hour traffic. We're not naturally inclined to do any of these things. They're the very definition of supernatural. Part of what it means to believe in the Holy Spirit as the giver of life is to grow in his character and not just in his power. 2 Corinthians 3.16 says it this way, for we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This verse is chapter 12, and the entire book in a nutshell. 
The point of the Christian life is to be like Christ. And the Holy Spirit is given to help us do just that. Now, one last thing. Chapter 12 is about the Holy Spirit. But it does touch on two, save, uh, two related subjects near the end, the church and baptism. My biggest regret in this book is not being able to give the phrase, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church the time it deserves. This statement is difficult for many people, and it was for me the first time I read it. But I believe in the church is ultimately the reason that I fell in love with the Nicene Creed. I could agree with every other statement in the creed the first time I read it. Maybe I didn't fully understand what it meant to believe in the incarnation or the resurrection or the ascension, but I knew they were true. But believe in the church? Not so much. Let's be honest. It takes courage to believe in the church to worship with someone who has wronged you, to learn from people who are just as flawed and hurt and broken as you are. An invisible God is far easier to believe in than a visible church. And it was this phrase that made me realize the Nicene Creed wasn't just a statement of faith. It was a challenge, something that I had to live up to. That was a crossroads moment for me. I could dismiss the creed and move on with my life, or I could look myself in the mirror and ask why I didn't believe. And that's where my journey into church history began. I went looking for a church to believe in, and I found it right in front of me, who despite its differences is still one, and despite its shortcomings is still holy and is Catholic because Christ is his head and apostolic because of the gospel that it has and always will preach. Maybe it's another phrase in the creed that challenges what you believe. Accept the challenge. One of the early readers of this book wrote to me and expressed how it is important to wrestle with each of the creed's terms and phrases, I can't think of a better verb. Sometimes the Nicene Creed is a wrestle, a struggle, but the struggle is worth it. Let the power of the creed be for you that first step into a faith far richer and deeper than you've experienced before.